Do you have enough subscriptions? Seems like everything's costing us a monthly fee now, whether it's my phone or my video service or my enterprise infrastructure. Wonder why that is. Could it be that subscription models are gonna save enterprise IT? Find out in this episode of the On-Premise IT Podcast. Welcome to the On-Premise IT Podcast, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and as a part of Gestalt IT, each episode we bring you the perspectives and opinions of a group of IT luminaries, experts in their fields on a variety of enterprise technology subjects. I'd like to take a moment for our guests to introduce themselves before we jump into the premise for today's episode, starting with Daryl. Daryl DeRocha. I've been doing Wi-Fi for, I don't know, 20 plus years and still making it work. Troy Martin. I work with Trogan Consulting. I do a mix of wireless IoT projects and a lot of uh, industrial spaces. Uh, Samuel Clements, uh, Technical Solutions Architect at WWT. Been in the Wi-Fi industry for you know, clip over 20 years or so. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Let's jump into the premise for today's episode. I don't know when the last time you went out and bought some enterprise hardware or control systems was, but hopefully you checked the budget line items because it used to be that you had reassuringly expensive sticker shock when you figured out how much that controller or analytic system was going to cost. But don't worry about it. We're going to throw it in from here on out. All we're going to do is charge you a monthly fee. You don't have to do capital expenditures anymore. You can do operating expenditures. It's like the cloud. Just run the credit card and everything's going to be great. So great, in fact, that almost everybody has moved to this model in the last year or so. You know why, don't you? Because subscription-based models are going to save enterprise IT. Who wants to take a shot at that? <laughs> I, I think they've already saved IT in, in a big sense. Uh, it gives us a predictable monthly spend. Uh, there's no sticker shock when we need to do mass rollouts of equipment. Um, we're, we're sold on the promise of uh, features that will become available down the road. Uh, and we can fund the vendors to develop those features ahead of time, which gives them the ability to, to schedule and plan for development of those features. So I think it's a huge advantage to put us in a good spot to save. Uh, and and I, while, the, while the finances do work out like that, I, I think I have to disagree. I, I've talked to more than one customer who has said, you know, we've moved from this massive CapEx spend for these large projects, and we've transitioned everything to OpEx, and now every year my butt clinches because I have this huge annual bill due. Now I want to move, I want to transition from, cap, from OpEx spend back to a big capital expenditure so I don't have these recurring costs every single year, month, whatever the time frame is. Uh, the whole feature innovation thing, right? We're we're gonna we're gonna charge you a, an annual fee, and what you're gonna get back out of this is 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 you know innovation and features and blah. Uh, it's a lazy excuse, I think. I, I think what we're doing is we're giving vendors a pass. We're allowing them to say, yeah, you know what, that code quality issue, yeah, we'll give you some time to shore that up. Yeah, you know those features over there, we'll give you we'll, we'll give you plenty of runway to go to go smooth those out. And you can treat us like a beta customer. We've heard from uh, many many customers. I, I feel like if you're going to pay for something, that feature should be developed or baked and is reliable before you have to pay for it. So if, if you're looking for something to be baked, reliable, and working before you pay for it, could we really buy any of the equipment or software that we're buying currently? No. Uh, we we no. always we <laughs> consistently find bugs. It's, it's, it's a given in IT that there will be bugs, uh, just as comforting as death and taxes are in, in other spaces, right? So that, that problem exists whether we have a subscription model or we have that one-time purchase. Yeah, but we're using that excuse of humans build networking, therefore it's fallible. We use that excuse... Uh, so often, um, and, and, and it feels like it's become a crutch. It feels like we can now no longer hold our vendors to a higher standard. We can now no longer hold them accountable. Oh, because, you know, there's humans. Ah, you know, there everything's got flaws in it. Everything's got defects in it. And it feels like it's become this crutch of, oh, my gosh, the, the, the world that we live in is just so challenging and complicated, and innovation and features and engineering resources and demand, it's hard to balance. It all feels like a tried, tired excuse. And to me, it feels like I'm being charged for the hardware, and then I'm being charged to use it after I right. bought it. And that, to me, is like, wait, why am I having to pay for this twice, right? Like, if I'm going to buy a car, do I have to pay also for every mile I drive it? 
But yes, it's called gas. Uh, well, yeah, you do, right? yeah. <laughs> unless you're driving a Tesla. Right? You want well, the then, firmware yes, update on your car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, you, 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 you're, you're not wrong, not by any stretch. It just feels like, um, especially when when you stop paying the bill, the gear stops working, right? And so it sets the mantra in your mind: what you're paying for is the privilege to operate the gear. And I feel like too many folks are sort of stuck with the, oh, I guess I have to pay for the privilege to run the gear, as opposed to, no, the gear is mine. I'm paying you for innovation. I'm paying you for things that you should have been delivering to me over the past one, two, three years, and you haven't. And then at what point do, does the vendor then decide, hey, you know, that hardware is not <laughs> capable of doing that feature that we sold you on, Right. So now you have to replace that hardware that we told you this was going to work, but it won't for whatever reason. So why does this not work in the enterprise? Because everything you guys just described to me is mobile phones. We're going to sell you a new phone every year. We're going to sell you new software that runs on In fact, we're even going to give you the software oh, for free, but you're going to have to pay for the new phone. It's going to be a little bit faster. It's going to have some bugs that we got to work out. Eventually, 10 or 12 years down the road, that, that phone's not going to run the software anymore. Well, it's not usually 10. It's more like 5. But why, why do we accept that in the consumer space, but we don't accept it in the enterprise space? Because in the enterprise space, they've turned, uh, they've turned the software upgrade updates into recurring revenue. You have to pay for them. You don't get software updates for free. You don't get the newest, latest, and greatest thing that the hardware platform can do. You have to continue to pay for that privilege just to be able to get the code to put it on the box to let it do it. Developers don't work for free, right? Apparently they do at Apple and Google, though, right? Because we get software updates for free from them. So why can the mobile phone industry do it, but why have we become so complacent in the networking industry to make it okay? Well, they, they are recovering the costs. It's just uh, depending on how you, uh, you market it, right? If you bake in the costs into the hardware, we can use that to offset the cost of the developers. So we're willing to pay uh, way more than we should probably for this uh, the hardware to give us the feeling that we're getting the software for free. And we used to be able to do that. That option's now long, now no longer there, right? That was that's the heavy capex spend, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you've had what twenty percent or whatever for maintenance on a sure. recurring basis, right? Yeah. But now it feels like it's closer to one hundred percent. Well, and it's sort of one thing when it's recurring maintenance that is a fraction of the price that is still considered optional. Yeah. It's another when it's mandatory maintenance because that's not maintenance; that's mandatory. Yeah, it's, there's it's a, a difference tax. between paying for it's a recurring tax, yeah. warranty in case something breaks, whereas now it's, if I don't pay this bill this month, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But the way that it's posed to people is not you're paying to operate this equipment. You're paying for all of these great features, many of which you didn't even know that you needed until we told you that we're putting them in the system and charging you a fee for it. And maybe you need like the, the entry-level license fee in order to do this feature. And there's this other cool feature that you need, but you're going to need the Plus license to use that. And Disney Channel only comes on the advanced tier, <laughs> and Nick Jr.'s on a different advanced yeah. tier that you're going to have to pay for. And I've heard this argument before, which is why I went to Netflix. Oh, wait, well, they just up the their prices thing. again, too. Yeah. And I also have to have Paramount Plus now, and I have to have, um, what's the Peacock other one? Peacock. I have to have Peacock and, and, yeah. and Disney Plus and... Yeah. We're, we're, we're finding out really quickly that a lot of the things that we loved about the model of being able to just get things, something as simple as Microsoft Office. I could run Office, I don't know, pick a random number, Office 2015 for years, as long as I didn't need one or two of those features, or it supported the platform that I was on. And then all of a sudden, the model now is you pay a monthly fee or a yearly fee, and I'll, get, I'll keep giving you new features that you probably don't even need or want. But as soon as you stop paying for that model, you can't use the software anymore. But it's it's one thing when it's when at, at God don't publicize this, but Microsoft gets credit where credit is due. Microsoft uh, the Office three sixty five costs are are literally a fraction of what the full Office mm -hmm. retail packages are, and so you literally can turn around and say, okay, well I'm going to spend five hundred dollars for the retail Office package, or four ninety nine a month. Like, there's yeah. some really compelling ROI mm -hmm. math there. And, and, it doesn't exist in the networking world. And, and, and Microsoft was probably smart enough to realize that the cost of renting Office for three years equals the cost of buying a new Office package every three years. Except now, I get detailed statistics and analytics on what my users are using 
and which features I need to devote developer time to in order to make sure my customers stay happy. And that is one of the other sides of the coin that a lot of people in the subscription model space don't really talk about. It's not allowing the developers to receive resources to continue to work on things. It's letting the vendors know what their customers are doing with it. How many people have this feature turned on? How many people have logged into this dashboard to see these statistics? They can literally pull those in an instant and go back to people and go, well, you told us that we needed to add this feature to the software, and as of now, 5% of you have used it in the last year. We're going to deprecate that feature because no, obviously you guys didn't want it. There is a certain piece of it that I think is working well. If I, if you just uh, anecdotally look back over the past 12 months, how many, how many catastrophic show-stopping failures and bugs did you experience? And then you take and you, and you ask yourself the same question over the past five years or 10 years. It, it, it does feel like we're in an era of increasing stability. And so on one hand, it's great because I think there is some prioritization that's getting focus on those critical features as opposed to the monolithic, everything must be stable, but it still feels dirty. We're all fans of things like video games and big you know, releases. How many times in the last five years has a big game or a big piece of software missed a release date? because there were bugs that still needed to be worked out. Have any of them actually made the release date? Some of them have. Here's the kingdom, did <laughs> A couple of years later. But you remember, they kept saying, oh, well, it's going to be out this year. And then on December 29th, they're like, oh, maybe next year. But one of the things that we keep seeing over and over again is by moving to these models, they can slipstream fixes and software and things to us on a constant basis so that Features don't even really have a release date anymore. By taking that, like I play Diablo, right? And when I go to play it sometimes, I have to wait 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just for the darn thing to update before I can actually do the thing I wanted to do. Oh yeah, there's nothing worse in my house than when my kids figure out that they want to play a game and it's going to require four hours to pull an update to do it. Yeah. And, and it's something they haven't touched in a while. But at the same time, you know, there are games on my iPhone that I can't play on the airplane because they have to be constantly connected in order to be able to <laughs> provide value back to the developers or what have you. But, you know, that's consumer stuff. Like, we kind of expect that now from these kinds of things. Like, when, when they announced that the new Diablo was coming out, oh, you always have to be on to play, everyone was like, well, yeah, kind of. But w when getting back to the enterprise thing, what is it, what, what is so compelling that makes people want to put up with this? Because it can't just be that, I'm using my OpEx budget now. But no, because the money is money. Because at the same time, the cloud <laughs> well, is the not answer to all of our problems, right? Well. So what, what, what if we took this to, to another level? Instead of just looking at uh, us managing the equipment, uh, buying a subscription to, to a cloud portal to, to manage our own gear and buy, buy the regular gear, um, what if we just paid a subscription model, uh, had someone else provide network connectivity for us and network services? Right, where they could guarantee a certain level of performance, uh, build redundancy into design, uh, manage all of our infrastructure, uh, provide updates as needed, take care of all the, the firmware updates, address all the bug fixes, resolve configuration issues, and we just paid a fixed monthly fee for that. That's and if network was, as a service. Exactly. Well, and so it's, that's the that's the, the the problem is is right. We've gone from the capita the capex spend, which is like going out and buying a car, to the opex spend, which is out like going out and leasing a car, mm -hmm. to the network as a service, which is the Uber model, yeah. and, and automated driving Uber. Uh, oh, but, mm. There's still somebody there, but yeah, you know, it, it it strikes me that that as you move to these as a service services, right? You completely back away from A, obviously any ownership, but also B, any input into how the thing should work. Mm -hmm. you, you basically say, I have a starting point and I have a finish point and hands off the steering wheel. But if it's meeting all of your requirements, do you care how it's delivered and implemented as long uh, as it uh, meets the requirements? It, it, if the industry didn't care, then we would all be 100% network as a service. So somebody somewhere cares because there's what, one network as a service player? I mean, it's an accounting thing, right? I mean, how you account for things when it's OPEX versus CAPEX, sure. you know, is, is very different, right? Yeah. You, you can't depreciate something you don't physically own. Correct. And, and some it, companies are much more on the CAPEX side. It's very true. Uh, your service providers want to have those assets and depreciate those assets. 
Whereas, you know, companies owned by private equity a lot of times will prefer that as an OPEX spend, right? Yeah. So it's just which side of the balance sheet that it's on. Oh, and don't forget the, the magical ability to threaten to pull that equipment out and go with somebody's competitor um, because we own it and we can do whatever we want with it. Um, you know, subscription models tend to make that a little, a little bit stickier. It's like, oh, well, you paid for a year of this. You totally shouldn't get rid of it until later because you've already paid that money. It's a sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. And it works over and over and over again. But I mean, any, any enterprise of size, right, if you've got hundreds of sites, there's a refresh cycle and you can't just pull the plug on something overnight. It's going to take you, you know, six months, a well, year, whatever it is. So, that's not what I told the sales rep when he came in and told me that my licensing costs were going up 25% next year. I'm, I'm yanking this stuff out, man. Good luck. And honestly, I think a lot of companies have said that. All right, go for it. So is there a happy medium between the as-a-service model where I don't own anything, I'm leasing an autonomous vehicle, and the old-school CapEx of I'm going to buy this thing and make all the payments and drive it till the wheels fall off? What is, if there is a happy medium, what does it look like? Again, I'm not entirely sure there is because largely our hands are being forced. Uh, at least there's no option that we have available to us today. Right. I, I, we, we simply don't have the option of a massive CapEx spend with no recurring non-mandatory OPEX for, from basically anybody. Um, I don't know that there's a single solution you can buy today and not give that company money next year and still have the gear work. Um, and, and so those options have just been simply taken off the table. Uh, whether we want them or not, I think that we're all being forced into that consumption model regardless. And that's why we continue to be successful with a lot of our IT deployments because we can adopt this subscription model and maintain pace with the, the, the accounting side of things, the finance side of things, uh, still get access to new features that have been developed. Uh, and ultimately, the subscription model is becoming the savior of IT. So what if I could do it without paying for anything? It would be better. Oh, well, but there's <laughs> going to be trade-offs. There's no reason why I can't just go order hardware from, from an ODM and run an open source operating system on it. No, but but our vendors created that problem to begin with. How many how many how many sixty five oh seventy six five hundred chassis have you seen that have been running for thirteen years? Twenty. I have one in my house right now. There you go. We used to have access to rock solid capex only gear, and then the industry sort of started to fall apart. It's like they self created the problem of oh well maybe if we make this less reliable we can transition folks over to some sort of recurring uh, justification for focusing on the features that they have. It's like, it's like they, they created the problem by imposing a bunch of crap on us and then they created a solution that f benefits them financially just to get us back to where we were because what, they didn't like the CapEx spend? They didn't like the fact that people spent CapEx every five or seven years. Yeah, well, well I think that a yearly. Let's be fair. They didn't mind, but somebody else did. Yeah. And that's the other thing that we have to talk about. You know who's really happy with subscription revenue? Shareholders. <laughs> is the people with a three-month timeline for every decision that they make. Mm -hmm. How does this look next quarter? How does this look the quarter <sighs> after that? And we've seen that time and time again is um, investors forcing companies to make decisions that increase shareholder value by um, unlocking wealth from existing product lines. How, how, what other euphemism can I say of, we're gonna charge the customers until they scream? So is part of this the result of the fact that companies just wanna keep the people's money taps flowing? And the only way to do that is to provide them with consistent, repeatable revenue quarter after quarter. I mean, it sounds like we're, still, we're trying to self-justify being, being a battered wife in a bad relationship. Like, it, 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 what happens if I go? Like, I can't stay, but I can't really go. It's like we're all sort of dancing around trying to make this okay, and nobody is going, yeah, I'm not going to tolerate that. I'm going to go somewhere else. But this is one of the reasons in a lot of uh, manufacturing and industrial spaces, you see them very slow to adopt new technologies, right? So as we've moved to this subscription-based model, which typically involves some sort of cloud connection, uh, these industries are staying with uh, their legacy equipment, and they're not upgrading which is becoming problematic with uh, features uh, and support and compatibility of those devices. But they are refusing to connect, but there's a penalty right now to do that. 
And I think that that's ultimately the solution when you think about it is the only way to get them to stop doing this is to stop buying their stuff. But can we survive the time that it's going to take for them to do an about face on these decisions? I mean, obviously, we're going to have to wait more than one quarter for the shareholders to start screaming about it. But what, what's, how, how do we halt this march to everything is a fee now? Do we just decide that this is it? We're not going to adopt the next wireless standard or the sli next slightly faster Ethernet standard. Um, we're going to use this until it burns out and go buy stuff off of eBay so that they don't get the money anyway. As a, I don't know that you can watch any speeds and feeds presentation and just wonder about the diminishing returns that we're facing here. Like, like at some point, uh, what is fast enough? You know, we're literally talking about 30 plus gigs out of a, a, a aggregate bandwidth out of an AP. Like these numbers are just jaw dropping no matter the use case. And so what's the next number gonna be? 150 gigs? Like at some point you gotta go, okay, like this is completely useless to me. Um, and so, you know, I'm not entirely sure, the, the, and I'm not entirely sure how we get from here to there. But if people stop buying, you sort of wonder how badly they're going to be damaged long term, right? Oh my gosh, I didn't buy the Wi-Fi 8 AP. How did that really impact me? Yeah. But if you get a lot of the uh, the large players, the ones who are buying like millions of access points at scale, to start uh, pushing back, saying, "Hey, we want to start uh, white labeling or white boxing our access points, so that we can just grab any off the off the off the shelf mm -hmm. access point." Um, develop open source management uh, applications that uh, you can uh, deploy yourself, migrate uh, to, uh, have the community start contributing and building their own. So if you have more of a, a grassroots kind of a, a conflict against the, the existing model that we have and provide another option where we could kind of self-serve and manage on our own, uh, that could uh, force the hand of the, the vendors to, to come up with uh, alternative pricing models. I mean, I've looked at stuff like that in the past and what I found on the service provider side was what's called, you know, noise floor isn't necessarily the same from device to device, or you know the RSSI or any of those things. So now, how do you accommodate when you know something is called the exact same metric and it's not at all comparable? Um, you mean between vendors? Yeah, or between the same vendor with uh, one generation versus another oh, generation gotcha. product. Yeah. Um, you know, specifically cable modems is what I was looking at, but like, you know, how they calculate noise floor was very different, uh, different things that we wanted to know from a metric standpoint and monitoring that it didn't call the same. So, you know, at what point is it, you don't even know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. But that's also where we're seeing projects like uh, OpenConfig uh, come out to help kind of bridge that gap between different products, different versions of hardware, calling things different names. So there is a lot of work, I agree, to, to happen on that place, but we're already seeing that movement to try try fill in that hole. Uh, I've seen it. I just, uh, trying to implement that has been problematic at best. Mm -hmm. All right, well, as you've heard from this discussion, there is some difference of opinion on whether or not the subscription models that we're seeing today are really going to be the saviors of enterprise IT. Yes, it's very wonderful that we're able to recognize revenue and provide resources where they happen to be and not have to keep writing these enormous checks every five to seven years on a refresh cycle. The other side of the equation, man, it feels like you guys are trying to pinch me for everything I've got by adding all the stuff that I don't want to use but not giving me the option of opting out of it. In the old days, if I didn't want to run Microsoft Visio, I didn't buy that part of the package in Office, and now it's just included and I can't do anything else about it. The only way that you're going to be able to make headway in this entire discussion is to have an honest conversation with your company about what's valuable to them. Do they want to own the equipment? Do they want to lease the equipment effectively? Or do they just want to have somebody else take care of it for them? And when you invite people to come in, you need to be very upfront with what, you're, what you want. And if that company doesn't offer an option to just buy everything outright, tell them to hit the road, Jack. You're not my savior today. But that'll just about do it for this episode of the On-Premise IT Podcast. I want to thank our guests for joining us. I want to thank you all for tuning in as well. We have a new episode about every two weeks on our website at gestaltit.com. Also on our YouTube channel, Gestalt IT Video. And you can famous, find us in your favorite podcast application of choice. We'll be back in another couple of weeks with another episode. Until then, take care of yourself. And remember, just stick to the press.